It's time. The ATM, the Apologise to Me Mark Watson podcast. We're going to be talking about the emergence, resurgence of New Zealand athletics. We'll talk about the Champions League. We'll talk about the new A-League franchise, Gary Lineker, the Warriors, Bournemouth, SVG, Test Cricket, all of that. Apologise to me. First and foremost, mate, some good news for you and for some in Muriwai that you've been white stickered. And I said to you and our listeners that I wanted to keep, you know, touching base with you over this because it's just too easy for the rest of us who aren't affected to get on with our own lives. And before you know it, weeks and months have passed. So I think it's been about four weeks that you've been away from home, isn't it? So what does this mean? So white stickered basically means, Marty, that, yeah, after all the assessments, the LIDAR, the LIDAR testing, which is this laser testing of the hills directly behind us. Um, there's been a lot of mapping done. I know that they've got some pretty world-class experts in there, and a lot of the information has been peer-reviewed. And just where we happen to be located in Domain Crescent, um, we're sort of at the bottom end. Um, they've deemed us to be safe, and therefore we can go back. And we've still got no water. That'll take about another week because there's a lot of damage to the water out there. But it's a little bit bittersweet. You know, we've got the houses and friends directly behind us who are red-stickered. Um, people across the road are, are still red stickered um, and there's others that are yellow stickered and so you know just going up our street yesterday which is really the first time I had an opportunity to take a little bit of a drive yeah just the sheer damage and the chaos and the carnage and you know I'd imagine there's still I think there's still 60 odd houses on our street that are red stickered and so you, you do have to feel for those people I, I, I've got a feeling that some will never get back in um, and others well it, it, it's going to take a lot, long long time so yeah, we're lucky, but um, yeah, still not great news for the community as a whole out here. Yeah, so what does that mean? Do you do you have to move back in now and then rebuild your lives? And at the same time, you're looking around, there's damage everywhere. The community's not the same. I don't even know whether the coffee shop open, the surf club's got to be rebuilt, roads have got to be repaired. I mean, all of this is going to keep going on around you. I mean, it, just, it must be surreal, mate. Yeah, look, it is. And until we live in it, we're not sure. I mean, Muriwai will never be the same. It'll just be different. Um, there'll be people who will be given the go ahead that might not just feel that comfortable living out here again, living with the hills and the mountains directly behind us. That's not us. I think I think we are uh, I think we are where we want to be um, more from where our kids and what our kids end up doing and their lifestyle as such. But yeah, it's um, going to be really, really strange with um yeah, some people smiling and other people still just asking the hard questions and wondering if they can ever return and what that mean, might mean from an insurance point of view. Um, yeah, the fact that we white stick and no damage to a house. I mean, you know, if we wanted to move out, what does that mean from a real estate yeah, right. cost point of view? And, and we're allowed to look at it like that because that's that, that ultimately what does affect us. That's where we are in life. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I guess the only thing is you just write it out and hopefully – like anything, like Christchurch, like hopefully the Hawks Bay and Bay are plenty in time, um, things will get repaired. And, you know, I think people, I, I think mankind, are, you know, is resilient. And so it's just a matter of sit back and wait and um, do what you can do. Apologise to me! All right, let's talk some sport, mate, because that's what we do, don't we? I mean, that's why you hear the ATM podcast. I don't know what to say. I wish I had some words to say to you that would mean something. I mean, I'm sitting here while you're saying that thinking... So if you wanted to sell your house, I mean, what's the value? I mean, is the value halved? Is anyone going to want to buy it? I, I mean, all of these questions. I mean, just the stress involved with that alone, mate. I mean, and just, oh, God almighty, my mind's going berserk no, no, on it. No, well, it is, though, Marty. I mean, you sit there and you go, and, and like I say, everybody looks, everybody's situation out here is different, and everybody's going to see it through a slightly different lens. And there's no right or wrong, because you've still got to breathe the gas in your room. And, yeah, we do. We sit there and go, did we just lose half a million dollars? Did we just lose a million dollars um, on the value of our property? Um, we don't know, but that's, that's you know, how serious the situation is and potentially could be. Let's talk something happy before we start getting, put the hobnails on, because a few people, a few things, a few events, a few sports need a kicking. But on the program today, Olivia McTaggart, uh, and yep. you know, with Olivia getting her PB, and we had um, Tom Walsh on the program last week. We've spoken to Rosie Elliott. We've got Zoe Hobbs tomorrow, I think it is. And when you stack up all of these names, and this event that's kicking off tonight at the Trust Stadium, Mark, when's the last time? And you love your athletics. When's the last time we had such a richness of talent in this country? Where maybe that the overseas stars, the big names that we all ooh ah ah, and we all hero worship and everything else. Well, I tell you what, mate, we're actually carving out a fair few of our own at the moment. 
Yeah, that performance from Olivia McTaggart was remarkable at four metres um, 60. I mean, that's starting to put her into, you know, genuine world-class performances. I mean, she'd want to be doing that consistently now. Um, I didn't think she was capable of that, but, you know, it just shows, you know, you build layer on layer, year in, year out, and sometimes you just have those um, breakthrough seasons. And you, you're right. I mean, who would have thought, say 20 years ago or 30 years ago when we were sort of growing up when middle distance athletics was very much the blue ribbon event that you turn up to track and field events now and the blue ribbon event is the shot put tom walsh versus jack o'gill zoe hobbs in the hundred can she consistently break 11 seconds then you go and look at the women's pole vault and the depth that we've suddenly got there with eliza mccartney as well and suddenly a young athlete challenging her and you want competition don't you as i said you don't have sampras without agassi um, and it, 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 it's great to see. I think it comes back to really good coaching. Uh, I've always said this, invest in coaches. Um, athletes come and go, but coaches last forever. I, I think the regularity of competition here over the New Zealand summer, I think Athletics New Zealand have got that right with the different meets they have around the country. And, and clearly funding does help. We've got our athletes now um, being exposed to international competition a lot more, which is important. But also I think the events that we are doing well in, I think are probably events, and, I, and I'm not afraid to say this, Martin, probably events that are not heavily drug-induced. Um, you know, I think Zoe Hobbs is, yeah, is probably running about as fast as you can run clean, and I'm not afraid to say that either. So, look, I think there's a whole lot of factors. I mean, we've seen fast times too because of the carbon plate shoes these days, and, and the tracks have become a lot quicker. And you know we've talked about we've talked about the track and field side of uh, the field event side of it. Um, you know Hamish Kerr as well. I mean he yeah, went sorry, yeah, exactly, yeah. two thirty four yeah. indoors. You know uh, again, uh, you know I'm often asked what the highlight of my broadcasting career is, and I'll say it was calling that men's high jump final in Tokyo, which was Hamish a part of. And you know if he if he wants to be a genuine medal contender, he's going to have to probably be going two thirty six, two thirty seven. But what I like about Hamish is that. After Tokyo, he decided to make some changes to his jumping technique. And often when you do that, Martin, you go backwards before you go forwards. And that can be frustrating. It's hard making change when you're starting to, you know, you're going 230 and suddenly you're going back to 224. But knowing that if you're patient, you work at it, you, you will get the gains. And we're starting to see that with him. And, you know, I think Jack O'Gill's the big improver. I think Jack O'Gill is a guy that has still got a lot more in him. Where I just wonder whether Tom Walsh has maybe reached his ceiling. You know, is he sort of going to ever consistently throw over 23 metres? He seems to be around that 22.30, 22.40, which is, again, good for another Olympic Games bronze, probably. But Jack O'Gill might just be that guy a year from now who suddenly takes that next step, um, like we've just seen with a number of the athletes we've mentioned. But but we shouldn't also underestimate just what we have got overseas, too, at the moment. You know, Sam Tanner in the 1,500 metres, um, you know, running the second fastest time in history by a New Zealander at the Commonwealth Games. Um, there are a number of very, Geordie Beamish, he just recently ran a 3.51 mile. And so we have some outstanding distance runners as well. So yeah, athletics in a really, really good place. It's just a shame that nobody's turning up and watching. And I can't sort of quite get my head around why. Uh, crowds yeah, seem pretty be, yeah. disappointing. And there just doesn't it, seem yeah. to be, just doesn't seem to be the number of people watching it. Well, you know, what they should do is relabel it women's rugby and then Sky would be out there in a heartbeat, yep. wouldn't they? And yep. they'd actually have 25 cameras and 19 different television shows on it and they would be promoting it to the hilt and every yeah. other our media organisation in the country. Yeah. I'm being facetious, but I'm also not being, no. mate, because that's the reality of it. And you know, on that same subject, you know, let's talk about the cricket earlier in the week. Lightning strikes twice, an amazing game at the Basin Reserve. How on earth could that be possibly repeated in Christchurch? And I was one of the lucky ones because I got texted in time to turn it on and watch it on Spark. And I watched that last hour unfold. But, you know, the question I, I have in my mind, and I've had a couple of Twitter wars about this, and this is the problem with social media in this country. It's dominated by morons, mate. It's dominated by um, anonymous Kylie Bunny 13 people who sit there wanking on their computers, don't they? And they don't even pop their head up above the parapet and say who they actually are. And it's also apologists for so many organisations. And I get into a war of words with people about Spark Sport and why the hell don't these organisations like Spark and New Zealand Cricket be honest and transparent enough to tell us how many people were watching? Because it's bloody important that we know these things. Because in 20 years' time, mate, when you and me sit there and we're knocking coffee cups in the old folks' home and going, we bloody told you so that you destroyed the sport 20 years ago because you took it to a platform that nobody was watching it. 
you know, that game was the classic case of if you were a kid watching that, you would want to be Kane Williamson for the rest of your life. How many were watching? Because you can't keep ducking and diving on this New Zealand cricket and you can't spark, keep saying it's commercially sensitive. It's no longer commercially sensitive because you failed and you're out of business. So there's no there's no reason not to tell us anymore. Well, they're not telling us because we know the numbers. We are know the numbers are real, absolutely, mate. And so, look, I agree with you completely. I mean, you do have to think: were there more people on the ground actually watching this? There might have been a thousand watching it. There might have been five thousand, but there certainly weren't any more than ten thousand. I know we had a conversation. If this had have been the last hour had have been live on TV and Z for both tests, the second test against England and this test against Sri Lanka, there would have been a million, million and a half people. I think it would have had. I think it would have captured the imagination of the country it's interesting off the back of the test that's just gone off the last ball i was you know had a number of meetings and different people at cafes on the north shore and no one was talking about it there was no sense of nationalism it wasn't the first talking point where you know on any other platform even sky television certainly tvnz that's all people would have been exactly talking about right. i think people would have been walking around with their chests just, you know, we all would have been playing a shot like Kane Williamson. We would have been false batting, ear batting with our hands, wouldn't we? That's what yeah. we'd be doing. Oh, I know. I mean, we all remember Lance Kenza's six sixes, yes. don't we? All remember Hadley's nine for fifty three, Martin Crow's hundred and eighty at that test. I mean, that's what television does. We remember all the great America's Cup moments. We remember all the great Olympic moments because it's accessible. It's there for everybody to see. But this is where David White and these guys need to be held accountable. Who are these people that get on the board? Where is their business acumen? Why would you take New Zealand cricket and give it to Spark because you might get an extra four or five million dollars out of it? because the intangible damage far outweighs $5 million. I mean, no one is watching this. You've got a competitive marketplace now for young kids. Basketball is just taking every sport, has put every sport under siege at the moment. Here is your shop window. Here are two of the most thrilling tests in the history of the game across any country, and they drop the ball on it. No one knows about it. No one's talking about it. Uh, look, and yeah, no, I mean, New Zealand cricket, that someone needs to be asking questions of David White. Is it time to turn that administration over? I mean, they they will quietly be praying for June first to roll around, and then it is handed over to TV and Z. But the problem is, it's too late now. You know, a generation will not be talking in 20 years about these two test matches like me and you romantically talk about some of the great moments. Yep, you know, that yep. Boxing Day test, 86, 87. Um, even though we lost it, they were, you know, they were gripping. You're on the edge of your seat. It was, it was what I call appointment viewing. Uh, look, j j just before we move on to the next topic, Martin, you mentioned the women's rugby. Um, and, if, you know, athletics was women's rugby. They'd be all over it. Isn't it funny that our women athletes do well, and yet the media who continue to push equity, continue to push equality, still don't want to seem to cover the athletics because it's not rugby. So they talk a good game, they virtue signal, but they don't believe there's enough commercial interest, so we won't cover it. And that's where I find the hypocrisy in it. Uh, by the way, too, um, OPAC Super Rugby Finals, uh, semi finals semi -finals on this North Harbour. Mm. Nobody is watching it. Nobody are going. If you switch on or see the highlights, there is no one watching women's rugby at all. And yet, we were told last year how this is the biggest thing since sliced bread. It's going to revolutionise the game. It's a big growth area in the sport. We were told, Martin, that we had to watch it. Uh, they almost implied that if we didn't, we would be misogynists. Well, those same people writing the articles, I didn't see them sitting there in the stadiums on the weekend. And the reality is this false economy that the media and the left and the feminists have shoved down our throat, the game cannot live up to it. It cannot live up to that hype. And we're seeing that, aren't we? People just aren't interested in it unless it's got World Cup attached yeah, to it. it. It's just not a good enough product, Martin. We don't have time, do we? And if we've got time, we're going to be sitting down on Saturday night. We're going to be watching the Blues Crusaders. We're not going to be watching the semifinals of the women's rugby. And that's okay. So the media just need to take a step back and just let this organically grow. And let the game remain amateur because there are not the dollars in it for it to be commercially professional. Apologise to me! Football, I want to talk about the Champions League. I want to talk about Bournemouth, but I can't really say much because the 7-0 is still stinging me. So let's talk about another A-League franchise for New Zealand. Now, it sounds like a good idea. And as a football fan, I look at it and I think, OK, wouldn't it be wonderful to have a local derby and everything else? But the realities of a $26 million license, I mean, just think about it in economic and business terms. 
you're not going to make any money. You don't make money out of sports franchises. You do it for altruistic reasons or whatever other reason. And unless somebody is sitting there and going to use it as a tax loss or a tax dodge company or something like that, or they're just such football fans that they decide, I'm quite happy to spend three million bucks a year and we'll just waste away on this because I love it so much. Look, I, I just have serious doubts about this getting off the ground financially, let alone do we have the playing strength? What, are we going to bugger around with the stadiums that haven't worked in the past? And then, of course, there's the fractured nature of the New Zealand, of the Auckland football scene and its individual clubs. I hate to be this, you know, bringer of bad news, but again, you know, these stories appear and they're just so puffed and fluffed and it's such a promotional exercise. No one's asking all of these realistic questions, which to me are the actual, are the actual whole point of this exercise. Is it going to be viable? No, it's not. We just don't have scale here, Martin. We've got a population of 5 million. We've got all these different sports. You know, if I'm watching football, I'm watching the English Premier League, mate. I might, you know, I don't watch the A-League. I, I know there's been times when, and I know this for a fact from people in Sky, there was times when the Phoenix have been on and only a 1,000 people have been watching it on Sky television. Um, yeah, I mean, someone comes along, they're going to be a multi, multi, multi-millionaire and they're simply buying it because their mate's got a big boat, I've got a big boat, they've got a nice car, I've got a nice car and it's going to be a little bit of sort of a bit of a pissing contest, one-upmanship. Um, yeah, we just don't have the market for it here. And what, are you going to play it at Mount Smart? You know, um, what an absolute disaster of a stadium that is. I mean, if you are going to do it, you go and find some sort of boutique ground, don't you? And you build a capacity of around about 5,000, create an atmosphere and keep it very boutique. But, you know, it's that $26 million. I mean, yeah, uh, I mean, sport, very few sports in this country can even, you know, remotely get close to that sort of revenue. And you're not going to get your money back on it. You're not going to sell enough T-shirts. You're not going to sell enough um, um, tickets. And, you know, the television revenue is not going to be enough for this to be sustainable. I, I mean, look at the Wellington Phoenix. Um, yeah, they're not making Vegas. money. I mean, that's the whole thing. 6,000 six, 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 six people along. I mean, it's just it's a terrible watch, isn't it? I, I mean, to be honest, mate, the football is awful. I, I'd rather just see us go back and in New Zealand and just focus on our National League. I, I really would. I think football in this country was better when we had a strong National League, when you had the likes of Miramar, when you had the likes of, um, you know, Blockhouse Waitaka Bay and, and Napier and, and Waitaka. And Blockhouse yeah. Bay. Mm, and, North Shore. I, I, think, mm. I think football was better. I think even to a degree the Phoenix have taken um, a lot of the emphasis and hype away from our National League, and um, I, which I think is a real shame. Um, and, and I think that should be a pathway then on to, say, Major League Soccer or some sort of third division type club in Europe, which then allows you to slowly work your way possibly into the English divisions like we've seen with the Winston Reeds, like we've seen with the Chris Woods. Apologise to me! All right, finally then, let's talk about the all-black coaching situation because every single name's been bandied about. And I'll tell you what frustrates me as well. When every single player is asked this question in all Super Rugby interviews, they say something like Aaron Smith the other day, he's asked about, oh, Jamie Joseph said Jamie's a great coach. All of a sudden that becomes a blazing head on. Aaron Smith says Jamie Joseph would be the best all-black coach. It's all just, good God, we're desperate, aren't we? I mean, these are the people that work in the industry that we work. We're just so desperate to try and create a headline out of something that we don't know what's happening and we can't know what's happening until they actually tell us what's happening. So can't we just park this and just wait? I mean, I, I, you know, every single every single day that somebody else's blown up comment makes front page headlines and a clickbait, it just it just frustrates the hell out of me. None of us know. You're just fishing. You're fishing in the dark, you people. No, look, I agree. We've said before. I think Sky these days from a as a platform for women's rights, and I look at things like stuff and the New Zealand Herald, and yeah, it, 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 it's just clickbait. It's no nothing more than tabloid type headlines. It's not even news, um, you know. Such an, you know, you know how it works. They do an interview and then they just take a line out of it, turn it into a major headline. I mean, what's the point of going to Aaron Smith? He's not going to say anything no, negative, is he? No. He knows Jamie Joseph. I mean, none of the players are going to say anything. They're just going to stay neutral on the whole thing. They don't want to upset Ian Foster. At the same time, they don't want to also upset who might potentially end up being their future coach and have an influence on whether they're an All Black or not. Look, I think everybody in this country, rightly or wrongly, that Scott Robertson should be the next All Black coach, but you have the sneaking feeling that might not happen, <laughs> and then it's just going because he just doesn't fit the mould, does he? You've got to fit the mould in New Zealand rugby. You've got to be slightly conservative. You've got to wear a suit and tie, and you can't be 
getting to out there where I think New Zealand rugby is just dying for a Scott Robertson. People just want some colour. People just want some change. But I just have a sneaking feeling that's not going to happen. But yet at the same time, the board are going to stand up there and, hey, I'm on the board of New Zealand rugby. It's just a nice little thing on their CV. They'll never say anything. They'll never get into any trouble. Mark Robertson, CEO of New Zealand rugby, he'll just continue to press on. They'll have the PR people in the background who are inept anyway, putting out the spin. They've been very, very good at owning the media in New Zealand rugby. Um, so look, fingers crossed, hopefully we do get a resolution, hopefully it is Scott Robertson, because I think it's important that we send a message to coaches here that you know if you stay here, you're loyal, you pay your dues, there is a pathway to higher honours. And I, I think everybody thinks he you know, he's he's um yeah, he's the next guy. So yeah, I'm with you on this one, Marty. Just let if you're gonna have news, have news. Not just this player said that and this player said that. That's not news, that's gossip. Devlin. Oh my goodness me! The platform.